is the Gauntlet Podcast. My name is Jason. And I'm Ollie. Ollie, thanks for being on the show. Yeah, no, thank you for having me. It's, it's a delight. <laughs> Good. So listeners, we are doing something of a brand new feature on the show. We're making lots of changes to the podcast this year in terms of format. And one of the things I want to do more of this year is to feature community members in the gauntlet as the gauntlet has grown and our sort of gaming tentacles have spread to different areas of the hobby. Lots of people have been kind of joining on and doing things and kind of helping out and pitching in. And I would just like to uh, use this podcast space to sort of not only talk about some of the things that they do for us, but also, uh, importantly, some of the other things they do uh, within the hobby. And so, yeah, so Ollie is Ollie Jeffrey. He is a layout artist who has worked uh, on Codex for us, but also the new game Young at Heart, Paranormal Rescue Squad. Uh, he was a Game Chef finalist in 2016. I don't know how much he wants to talk about that. <laughs> I'll give him a chance maybe when we get going. And he's also a game designer working on a project called Little Gray Cells, which is what we're principally going to be talking about today. All right, so I know your Englishness is not going to be able to allow you to ably cope with this uh, <laughs> public praise, but I'm going to do it anyway. So we began the Codex project, listeners. I guess I started planning it as early as last March or so. Um, I was planning it months before we actually started doing it. And at that time, I was really scared. I was so freaked out about where the, where this project was going to go and how we were going to do it. I had never done anything like publishing, right? Nothing like that. I've never... I've never done anything like, you know, putting together text, uh, you know, soliciting for submissions, working with artists, doing editing and layout. I had never done any of that. And so it was a bit of a scary process. And in fact, I think our first effort was so-so, <laughs> but um, it was so-so. It was not, I think it was okay. From a content standpoint, I thought it was pretty good. But Ollie got in touch with me and uh, basically said, hey, look, um, give me a chance to work on uh, the, the first issue of Codex. Give, give it a go with my layout stuff and let me see what you think. And it was fantastic. If you're on the Patreon and you get Codex, you know already that Codex, if nothing else, uh, looks beautiful. It's a really, really <laughs> beautiful product. And so I'm just super thankful to you, Ollie, Thank for you. kind of getting in touch with me and kind of getting on board with the project because it has given me the the confidence to sort of press forward with it, right? I think I was looking forward to months of like um, stumbling and humiliation until we got it to where I wanted it to be, right? But you kind of dived in there, made it look really sharp and professional, and I'm super, super oh, grateful you. for that. So, um, Cheers. So yeah, that'll be the, yeah, yeah, that'll be the, uh, the extent of what we're talking about with Codex. Yeah, so let's talk about Little Gray Cells. That's what I'm mostly interested in right now. Okay, sure. So Little Gray Cells is a game that I got a chance to play test with you a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Give us an overview of what it is. Okay, so Little Grey Cells is a, it's a, a story game, and it's a, a murder mystery story game. The idea of which is that, uh, it's for three to five players, and between you, you collaboratively create a, uh, a great detective. So someone like Poirot, or Sherlock Holmes, or, uh, Veronica Mars, or, uh, is it Miss Fincher? I think it's the other one. It's on Netflix at the minute. Uh, so um, one of the, um, I was thinking of uh, Miss Fletcher, isn't that uh, uh, Murder, well, she Jessica wrote, Fletcher? She? Yeah. yeah, yeah, you could definitely do a you could you could do a Jessica Fletcher. Although I'm pretty sure yeah. she killed them all anyway, so that would be sort of. I like think a, she did too. Yeah, yeah she was totally a, the killer. That's a double bluff one. So you create them. Uh, you also all together you create their their companion. So you create their their Watson or their their Lisbon, Patrick Jane, and the Mentalist, that sort of thing. And you create all the suspects as well. And then you've got an emergent mystery which evolves throughout the scenes. You all take turns in narrating clues, and then at the end of the game, you'll all decide on what the solution of the mystery is together. So when I played it, I got a distinct feeling of, mechanically speaking, not thematically speaking, mm. but I got the feeling of Lovecraft-esque. Oh, yeah, absolutely. A little bit. Yeah, no. I got the feeling of The Final Girl, which yes. was very appealing to me. Yeah, yeah. Were those some of your influences on the game? Yeah, absolutely they were, yeah. Um, back on my G Plus uh, page a little while back, you'll find a, a post that says, have the sudden urge to mash up Lovecraft-esque and The Final Girl to make a game about Poirot. Uh, that's... <laughs> Delivered. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And some people kind of like, like more people than I expected 
discussed it and commented on it and got excited about just the idea. So I thought, oh, go on, then I'll actually, I'll actually do that. And actually, the idea came about during the Lovecraft-esque scenario competition that they ran a couple of, a uh, couple of months back. Uh, yeah, so yeah. I was, I was planning some scenarios about that. And one of the ones that I wrote was sort of like, it was set in Narnia, but it was set post-war in Narnia. So it was kind of, it's kind of like, Casablanca noir kind of version. I was like, well, even if I took all, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's it's a weird entry. It's it's admittedly it. weird. Um, I need to go back and look at that one now. That's very interesting. Yeah, thank you. But then I was like, uh, if I even if I strip all of the the additional weird stuff out of it, just the detective element of it appeals to me. And the sort of in Lovecraft desk, you've got the the clue finding element and the sort of the, the collaborative emergent mystery element on it. And I've showed it to Josh and Becky, who wrote Lovecraft Desk, and they've been they've been really helpful so far. Oh, good, awesome! That's great. I'm really hear. supportive. Well, so we, we've kind of hinted at it a little bit, but just sort of mechanically speaking, what's going on in Little Gray Cells? Okay, uh, so it's a GMless game, so everyone takes it in turns to play the detective, to play the companion, and to uh, to play one of the suspects in the scene. And the suspect in the scene who rotates around the board and is chosen from a a variety of characters that you've created, they take a sort of quasi-GM role, and they're going to lead the detective through to finding the clue in each scene. And then everyone records all of the clues that you've got, and at the end of the game, you will then all work together to sort of come up with something that feasibly stitches all these clues together in an answer to the murder mystery. I should note as well, actually, in the, the first few scenes... You've just got the the suspects all interacting together and sort of coming up with a, a web of lies and deceit. And then uh, on the fourth scene, you kind of shuffle them all up and that's who's murdered. You just kind of pick one of them out. So you never even know who the victim's going to be at the start, let alone who killed them. And so that it doesn't just go straight through with everyone kind of knowing immediately what all of the clues mean. I've worked in a, a few of the tropes of the, the detective genre as well. So... One of the things which is key in detective things is your your Hastings, your Watsons, that those sorts of companion figures. They always get the the answer to the mystery wrong. So there are scenes throughout called companion right, scenes. Yeah. <laughs> One person takes a turn to be the companion and they give their theory on what's going on so far. And their theory on what's going on so far is definitely, definitely wrong. So they, they can't see anything right in that scene. And the detective takes sort of great delight in telling them exactly why they're wrong. But those are some of the things that can't be worked into the final solution. That was my favorite part of our playtest. Um, oh, yeah, we did the playtest of Little fun. Gray Cells. I absolutely loved that part of the game because I think we had like, there's about two scenes like that that we did. Yeah. And it was terrific fun. One person plays the, the definitely wrong companion yeah, and, the yeah. other, and then someone else is playing the, the detective. And it was just, it was just great fun to have like the companion like working through, you know, trying to explain like why this might be the answer. This might be the answer. And then just the detective like kind of, sl- you know, throwing them down and making them look like foolish or I don't yeah, know. Yeah, it that- just, it was, it was a pretty, it was, it was pretty terrific touch. Like everybody really enjoyed those scenes. It, and you get to be that real sort of Sherlock arsehole as well, where you just right, get to, exactly, yeah. <laughs> where the companion works really hard. And that actually is quite a hard scene for the companion because they have to come up with some sort of coherent theory as to what's going on so far. And then you're just going to go, no, no, not nope, that, sorry. not that at all. Yeah. <laughs> Clearly that's not the right answer. <laughs> right. And <laughs> another trope, um, from the detective genre, particularly in a sort of your old Poirot style genre is the, the, the kind of the false accusations at the end where you get everyone together in the dining room and you just kind of point at various people and say about terrible things they've done that makes it look like they did the crime. But then you go, but it was not you. Uh, so we worked that in as well. And everyone takes it in turns to play the detective in the sort of the drawing room accusation scene. And they take it in turns to accuse one of the suspects. But then that person cannot be the final killer. So when everyone comes together to make up their clues at the end, they know certain things are not true because of what the companion said. And certain things are not true because of what the detective said at the end. So you're you're left with a sort of a slightly smaller field and it kind of funnels what the final solution can be. Well, so we played a very, very early play test of the game. Mm-hmm. I gather Gauntlet Houston also did a play test of yeah, it. Yeah, they Even, did. Yeah. I think they were the first people, right, to play test. They were, it. yeah, yeah. Even without yeah. me there, which was lovely. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious, what kinds of feedback are you getting? And like, what is like, because this is very much in development, right? Very, very early development. It, yeah, still. yeah, absolutely. Still is. Yeah. What are some of the, the sort of challenges or sort of like rough points that you're kind of working on right now? 
Uh, well, during some of the, the first playtest, one of the, the things we found was that the detective was in all the scenes and he just didn't need to be in, in those opening scenes. Until the murder's done, there's no real need for them to be there at all. Unless it's Jessica Fletcher, but yeah. <laughs> Unless it's Jessica Fletcher, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because she's not really the detective, right. obviously. Because she um, did it, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the detective has come right out. Uh, up until the point of the murder. They can be there. They can sort of be holidaying in that sort of location. They don't have to be there specifically to investigate a crime, but they're not involved in those those opening scenes. Um, the biggest problem I'm having at the at the minute, or the, the thing that I'm sort of trying to work the hardest through, um, which is a problem in quite a few story games, is that sort of lack of uh, momentum. At the start of a lot of games, so like at the start of Fiasco, which is like probably the... Well, it's, it's the classic story game, if not necessarily the best one, although it's very, very good. It's kind of hard to kind of go, right, we've got this big kind of web of relationships now, and what do we do with that? What do we, we do actually... now, right? It's a classic yeah. fiasco problem, right? What do we, now that we've done all this, now what, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, and fiasco, once it starts, is fantastic. But it does have that initial problem of when you, yeah, that, that sort of kickstart problem. And I've got exactly the same problem here sort of getting the momentum going in those first few scenes so that's what i'm trying to trying to give some sort of mechanical oomph behind those scenes because in the final girl uh you're sort of motivated to make relationships in those opening scenes certain characters can survive later on or they stand a better chance of surviving if they have more relationships if you haven't played the final girl but i don't have anything like that in little gray cells currently so that's what i'm currently looking for i'm looking for something that works i've tried a few things that have sort of that haven't worked so great so once i get that sorted that's going to be the that's going to be a big hurdle so i know we um we chit chat about like game design projects that people mm-hmm. are working on in our slack group i'm curious have you made sure. the, have you made the playtest draft of little gray cells available somewhere so if anybody has any feedback like if you're even looking for that kind of feedback i don't know but um uh, i haven't but I, I certainly can yeah yeah no that'd be great i'll um i'll, I'll put up a link if you wanna... yeah it might, it might be fun to make it just to see what people think i mean yeah, yeah. i i find that you know, when I was working on my game, Public Access, which is <laughs> kind of mm. stuck in like uh, the hell of me never being happy with it, and probably will not be for years. Um, it, but I want to see that as well. I, that, that, oh that no, no cool. I mean, I actually, it's fine. It's just one of those things where I, I just, I just obsess over every little thing. You know, I need to just at some point be happy with it and just let it go. You know. <laughs> but no, uh, one of the things I found to be very helpful was when I kind of initial put the initial playtest thing out there. You know, yeah. people, <laughs> lots of people love to say what they think about things, right? And it's not, al- <laughs> it's not always super useful, but, um, every now and then, you know, you're like, Oh, okay. That's a really good insight. I'm never going to tell yeah. them that, but I think they're, um, <laughs> but I think that's a good, yeah. Criticism has a lot of validity. So, uh, no, yeah, it might be worth doing. Cool. I'm, I'm really excited to see where it goes. So like Thank so you. far for little gray cells, we've kind of maybe touched mm-hmm. on it a little bit, but what is your favorite part about little gray cells? Like, you know, once it's a fully realized, game that meets your design goals what will people love mm-hmm. about little gray cells i think what they i think what people are going to love when they're playing is the sort of the the ability to kind of get fully into those tropes because it's a, it's a very it's a very tropey game it's very very sort of poirot or um sherlock kind of a thing and i think that will flow nicely for the same reason that D D works because people are aware of those sort of those big high fantasy tropes uh, and I think people will like getting involved in that. And the the other thing I like about it being detective genre as opposed to being, say, high fantasy or something like that, is it's potentially a story game that I can get people who aren't into role playing at all to play. Like I couldn't get my mum to play D and D, but I could get my mum to play this potentially, and like I could get my wife into this as well. So it's it's kind of nice that it's a it's a sort of a, like a, a broader genre piece. I think that's really smart, and and. And, and, and almost certainly true because I find that's the case with the final girl or games like cheat your own adventure or, um, yeah, yeah. actually c- certain fiasco play sets too actually go over really well with non gamers. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I've always thought this, like people, some people disagree with me on this, but I think non gamers, it's not the, it's not the mechanics or this sort of like gaminess of it that they're turned off by. It's they just don't know shit about dragons and elves, right? And so they, yeah, you know, so like they, yeah, they, yeah. Don't, they don't, they don't, so we can't, you can't expect them to like dive into that and have fun if they're not like steeped in it, you know? Um, yeah. But, you know, everyone knows stuff like Poirot and, and Sherlock and mm-hmm. uh, oh, oh, Veronica Mars is a great example, right? For like the younger set or whatever, right? I mean, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. people can grab onto those things, right? And, and kind of, you know, at the very least, they understand the conventions of the genre and they understand the sort of basics of the tropes. And so even if they're not quite like up to speed on the 
just the basic act of role play or like managing the mechanics or whatever, at the very least they understand the genre conventions and it's something they can kind of get into a little bit. So I think that's also going to be yeah. a great thing about this game. Um, I think people are going to be Thank able you. to get into, into that part of it and it could be a good gateway yeah. for other things. So I'm, I'm super excited about it. That's one of the things that makes the final girl shine because I've uh, introduced that game to people whilst tipsy at a party and it still works. <laughs> right, it still like... works. It'd be even better possibly. Right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. That's cool. Uh, that's good. Yeah, I'm excited about it. Well, so I don't know uh, what you're able to share about the game's future, but like where, what, where do you, what's happening with little gray cells? Like what's your long-term plan or short-term plan or whatever for it? Uh, well, it's still, it's still, as you say, it's very much in development at the minute. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's gone through a few play tests and it, it works, but it needs, it needs a lot of polish at the minute. So it's sort of early days. Okay. But I'm, I'm hoping to kickstart it eventually with, okay. within the next sort of 12 months or so. And that might end up being, uh, well, I've been working quite closely with Josh Fox and Becky Anderson, who wrote Lovecraft Esque because it's, I stole quite a lot of their game design for it. <laughs> uh, and they were very gracious about that and they liked it. So one of the things which might be happening is a Kickstarter, which is sort of masterminded by them. Now they're super cool. Like I have to imagine they are they're they're really excited people. about it. Yeah. Cool. Well, let's switch gears before we go to giving me life. Let's just switch gears a little bit mm-hmm. back to Codex sure. for a hot second. So yeah, yeah. A lot of our pa- our patrons who are into Codex, or actually, we probably have a lot of listeners who have the first couple of is- issues of Codex. That the first two issues were downloaded like thousands of times. But um, I need all those people to go back us on Patreon. That would be great, listeners. Yeah, um, yeah, they, they should. It's, it's really good. It's, it's really got better good. as well. Yeah, um, yeah, it's, yeah. It's even it's significantly better than those first two issues, even though those were both pretty great. No, they they, they were they were great, but it's the sort of I think it's kind of hit its stride really. Yeah, yeah. I I think I think so. In terms of like the the sort of articles that are in there now the the, the quality of the articles in the first two is great as well uh, but it's just kind of like the the format of it uh it's sort of repeatable if you see what i mean now yeah i think that's right well so uh, the reason why i was going to bring it up was because i think all the people who have checked out codex so far probably don't know like how we go about putting it together because mm, we actually don't yeah. talk about it very much on the podcast. Like I, <laughs> I plug it sometimes at the end of a podcast, but I never really talk about Codex much. And so one of the things that we do, our process is once I get all of the articles back and we've done an editing pass and then we're happy with it at that point and we get all the art, we kind of kick it over to Ollie at a certain point to do layout. And we don't see the layout until it's done. <laughs> like, we can, like, <laughs> like Ollie, like I trust Ollie. Mostly okay, there's, there are a couple things that play there. One, I totally trust Ollie just to come up with something awesome. And so I don't really worry about it too much, but also I'm super, super busy and I don't really have a lot of time to be checking in like periodically on every little moment too. So it's kind of like a win win for both of us, honestly. Like Ollie gets to have full creative control over doing the layout and I get to just have the thing when I need it. Right. But my question for you though is like, what is your yes. thought process when you're going into the layout? Like for all your layouts, not just for codex, like what are you, what are you looking at? What are you aiming for in terms of like either readability or like creative artistic decisions? Like what's your, mm-hmm. what's your thinking? Okay. Uh, well, readability is key because if you, it doesn't matter how beautiful is something is, if you can't do anything with it, especially when you got a, there's a lot of great content in there, you do want to obfuscate that. So I'll read through the article, kind of get the gist. The the art which I get in, which is sort of universally fantastic, helps so much as well because I can kind of get a get a read from there. Uh, so with a, a combination of the art that we have and the the subject matter, just kind of get a kind of get a vibe from it from there. Basically, I, I'll often start with fonts, uh, which is like super specific and maybe maybe a little dull, but that's that's where I go. I put the the title into into all different fonts from Defont. And, uh, and kind of go from there, start just kind of playing around with a few things in, uh, in InDesign. Um, sometimes there'll be kind of like a, a theme across the whole magazine. The first couple actually had like a particularly strong through theme throughout. There was a lot of blood splatters and kind of deep reds in blood. And there was a lot of neon and, um, kind of like computer kind of looking stuff basically in Chrome because that was a, a cyberpunk issue. But sometimes the, the, the articles in the, in the magazine were very, very, really widely. So in Dark, which was the most recent one, there's a kind of a, a superhero adventure at the end for 66. And I tried to make that look really kind of pulpy and, and like, not like a comic book, but had that sort of like comic book influence to it. And that kind of like, kind of like a pulp, pulp novel funk. Yeah, cover, yeah, it came through for uh, sure. Yeah. For that one. But there's also at the start of that one, there's a, a really 
creepy ass minigame by, by Wendy Gorman. Uh, by? Yeah, it's by Wendy, Wendy Gorman. Gorman yeah. That's it. It's very creepy. Um, I'm never playing that. <laughs> it is. No, 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 no. It just sounds alarming. Um, and we had that great illustration by Dirk as well. So I just kind of wanted to make that look as creepy as the game itself was. Uh, so I kind of, I, I did a little more more obscure stuff with some some of the font sets. So stuff was at uh, weird angles. And now I was trying to make it look like. Uh, do you remember John Doe's diaries in the film Seven? I do. Yeah, Where, yeah, yeah that's actually yeah, yeah, a really that's, great touchstone. Yeah, that's that's that's, that's, that's what I'm trying to yeah. get for that. Yeah, I, that reads. Now that you mention it, cool. You know, one of the things I love about the way you do the layout and the sort of like the way it's very stylized is. The original idea for the for the project was I want it to be a zine, right? And to me, that means a certain yeah. thing. You know, it has like a certain meaning. And RPG yeah. zines actually are a little bit – they're a little anodyne mostly. You know, they might have like a cool art mm-hmm. piece in the front, but they're otherwise just like neatly blocked text with tables and, you know, maybe a little bit of art here or there. But when I think of zines, I think of like, you know, the punk zines from like the late 70s yeah, and yeah. early like 80s, right? Photocopied like, stuff. Like really, really like like visually striking. And so I was really happy that you put like this really strong emphasis on like visual flair for each of the articles because I think that's kind of matches up with like my idea of a zine, right? Like what I think a zine should be. Not that I don't love RPG zines. I love RPG zines. But I like that ours is like RPG zine with some actual zine in it right <laughs> like some like you know sort yeah, of like punk yeah, yeah. scene you know very very visual in nature it, the, we, we go off the tracks a little bit in the sense that i think our product is of a significantly higher quality than a lot of zines were like you know like it's <laughs> people always say gosh this doesn't look like a zine like if you had 20 more pages this would be like a full magazine right like but um anyway i'm super proud of it i think what you're doing with it is so awesome Oh, thank you. Well, it's it's fun to do that stuff as well. It's it's the other thing is, um, if it was just black text on white all the time, I I would get bored. Right. Uh, yeah. So part of part of how it looks is is kind of entertaining myself yeah, yeah. as well. It, but, it gives uh, it a stamp. You know, it's like yeah. Whenever I crack open a new issue, I'm like a crack open. That's, I'm using it very figuratively because they're only PDF. But like whenever I'm like <laughs> looking at a new issue, I'm always I'm always just kind of delighted by the whole. You know, I'm already familiar with the content. You know, I've had weeks to get used to that. But but then the but then you marry it with the art and the and the layout. It's just such a great great thing and a terrific value. I think so. And the, yeah, it is. And the art is great as well because I, I I've said it before, but the the artists make me look really good. <laughs> they are very good. Yeah, because yeah. if I if I plonk a, one of those illustrations on a page, it immediately looks good. And if I you know work the layout around it and the, and the content that kind of makes the whole thing sing, but it it wouldn't be the same without without those art for the couple of articles that i've written as well it's super exciting seeing what the illustrator's done with what i've written yeah yeah <laughs> yeah it's 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 pretty neat cool uh well so real quickly before we go to gml i know I've, i'm just yeah. delaying gml constantly <laughs> tell us just real briefly about your finalist on game chef oh okay yeah sure um so i think the themes were technology dance or i think it was technology music sunlight uh, I think that's right. We don't do a lot of coverage of Game else. Chef on the on the Gauntlet, so that's yeah. I'm not super. That's kind of why I'm. I'm also asking because I'm actually not. I don't. I just don't cover Game Chef. I, I don't. I, mean, I need to. I <laughs> okay. think next year I'm going to try to. But yeah. So what was it about? It was a story game about a couple that meets at a party, falls in love, and then the next year uh, they go to the same party and they break up. And then this, and it's set at the, the third year where one of the, the two lovers has gone there by themselves and they've seen their, their ex in the crowd and they're reliving scenes from those ah. first two parties during, during this new one. Um, but one of the things you can do in it, because it was the, the themes of technology and I, and music and I kind of got this idea of remixing stuff is you remix the scenes basically. Oh, okay. uh, so, which is rolled on a, rolled on a dice pool. And you can, during the scenes, you can kind of turn the dice around, take them out and kind of change what those complications are. So it's kind of like you're, you know, like when you win an argument in your head, when the argument has gone like months before, it's, it's that kind of thing. It's kind of, it's, it's remembering things how you want to remember them mm, is, is the idea yeah, of it. Yeah. Um, huh. And it's, uh, yeah, it's called Clicks and Hums and Sirens in the Sun, uh, which was, <laughs> It is, uh, it's a, a lyric from a song by Emmy the Great, who I love, and her lyrics are kind of peppered throughout. Cool. Awesome. Yeah, I feel like I've seen that movie. 
before you know as you've described it you know like i've seen that movie <laughs> yeah. i feel like so that's cool yeah it's got a little bit of 500 days of summer about it the sort of the, yeah the yeah, yeah exactly yeah, that's, i was thinking of that yeah yeah there's stuff along those lines cool um let's go to the next segment this episode of the gauntlet podcast is being sponsored by our friends at nocturnal media so listeners i've been thinking a lot about this deal that nocturnal has put in place with sigil stone publishing that's uh, ben dutter's imprint what they're going to be doing is making offset print runs of some of his more popular books available, which is really kind of cool because I don't think they're otherwise easy to get a hold of in physical form. And so I'm pretty pumped about that because a lot of friends of mine in the Gauntlet, particularly in Gauntlet Houston, have played games like Vow of Honor and Belly of the Beast and Hunt the Wicked, and they like them a lot. And so I've been meaning to check them out. Well, so I discovered a really cool thing that I want to tell you guys about. Over on DriveThru, Ben has quick start versions of those games available for free on DriveThru. And I've been downloading them and looking at them because basically I just need to be like finally convinced that yes, I want to own physical copies of these books. So go do that. I mean, there's no reason not to go check these games out. Ben's got a really, really awesome like design vision <laughs> that I'm into. And I'm getting pretty excited about it. I can't wait for those physical print runs that Nocturnal is going to be doing. So yeah, go check out the quick starts. They're totally free. We'll have links in the show notes. And thanks again to Nocturnal for sponsoring the show. Hey, it's giving me life. I'll start. So the thing giving me life right now is... Okay, so it was originally going to be the Nintendo Switch because Nintendo just announced their brand new system. They released a lot of details mm-hmm. about it. It's called the Switch. Uh, I'm not going to get into all that right now. That's This is not a video game <laughs> podcast. But we created a channel on our Slack for the Nintendo Switch to like so that those of us who were interested in it could just follow along and like kind of chit chat with each other while they were announcing various games and things. And, um, it's, it was that Slack conversation that's giving me life. Uh, we, we got on there. It, <laughs> the Slack channel became nothing about, at a certain point, it, it had nothing to do with the Switch anymore. It was all just like, all of us just making like weird, lurid sex jokes about like Nintendo characters, you know, <laughs> and like, like it was, it was just, it, just, it went to this really strange place because, because the, the announcement was really late at night. So it was like really late at night. Okay. And we, it just went to this really like weird, lurid, bizarre place. I went on at some length about like my stable of like half naked, beautiful boy fighters <laughs> in Soul Calibur because that's what, because you could, because you could do that at a certain point. You could create your own characters. Yeah, and yeah. like, and we just like, we, we started going into like the sexual appetites of various citizens of the Mushroom Kingdom. Like it was crazy. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah. So anyway, it was just kind of one of those goofy little moments that occasionally happens. And, um, I think we were all, uh, we we're all better for it. That was giving me life. That sounds <laughs> uh, Ollie, what's giving yeah. you life? Uh, what's giving me life uh, at the minute is gaming with my family, which sounds maybe a little bit saccharine, but it's really fun. I've got a, a few things going on. I'm playing a, uh, a campaign of Pandemic Legacy with my oh, wife. Everybody is uh, right now, we're, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, we're, we're terrible at it. Um, all of Asia is on fire. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> things are not going well there, but it's but it's a really nice thing to play through. I'm uh, I'm also playing. We're calling it Dungeon World, but it's it's not really Dungeon World. Uh, a very sort of stripped down version with my five year old. Ah, nice. <laughs> which which is so much fun, uh, and he's getting really into it. Sort of like he'll wake me up and be like, "Can we play Dungeon World?" Like, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we just got it down to the the two d six roll for whenever one of us tries to do something, and it's just I've explained it as either something good happens, something good, and something bad happens, or something bad happens. Oh, that's uh, good. And yeah. he's been. Yeah. And he's been GMing it for me as well, which is lovely. He just says, I'm going to be the teller now. And that's, that's <laughs> nice. him, that's him GMing. That's awesome. Actually, it's so funny you mention it because I'm fairly certain the next episode of the show, Lowell is going to be talking to Will Patterson about like him oh, yeah. gaming with his kids. So yeah, that's, that's a little nice uh, synchronicity there. I guess that's what we are now. The gauntlet is skewing toward kid having age. <laughs> so <laughs> um, no, it's awesome. Uh, sorry, continue. I didn't mean to cut you off. Uh, no, I was just going to say, uh, me and Will and Tor, um, were talking briefly about doing a sort of collaborating on a, uh, sort of a dungeon world for kids. Uh, but then we all had kind of separate ideas and kind of went, I, I want to do mine. One. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, that's how that goes, right? Yeah. 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 So, uh, so we, we were three chiefs. Yes. Uh, yeah. I think. Yeah. <laughs> I know how that goes. That's why I, that's why sometimes I just have to decide to be the chief, right? It's like, okay, you, uh-huh. know, you just yeah. have to be the chief sometimes. I think it's a cool idea though. I think there's something there. 
because uh, Rich recently, his little boy ran World of Dungeons for his friends. And I actually thought mm-hmm. it was a really interesting choice because I consider World of Dungeons to be the harder of the two, but, but, yeah. it, but in a different way. But it makes sense for a kid to run World of Dungeons because they just need like a stripped down rule set, right? Whereas mm-hmm. like when yeah. I run World of Dungeons, I'm thinking about like – taking that stripped down rule set and like magnifying it. So that it's something bigger even than dungeon world. Right. So like the, gotcha. so, so it's kind of an interesting idea. I do think there's some space there though, for, for a PBTA game that is kind of like geared towards kids that would still be enjoyable for adults to play. I think there's something there. You guys should, you should explore it. Ollie. I think that would be cool. Uh, well, Will's doing, um, I think it's called world of dreams. Uh, and that's looking really cool. Oh, okay, cool. So the, I was... the, the thing that, that has come out of that looks great. Anyway. Oh, cool. Maybe I'll, I'll ask Lowell to, to hit him up about that. See what that's all about. Awesome. Do you have anything else? Uh, no, I don't think so. That was cool. Okay, cool. Uh, well, so we're going to sign off here in a second. Thanks so much for being on the show. This has been super fun. Where can people find you either on social media or do you have a website or anything like that? Uh, I, I have a, a largely vested goal, uh, website. Uh, so the best place to find me is on G plus. I'm, uh, just Ollie Jeffrey on there. Awesome. Thank you. And listeners, that's our show. If you want to get in touch with us, we are most easily found on G plus or, uh, we also have a website, which is gauntlet RPG.com. And we're on Twitter at gauntlet RPG. I want to encourage you all to go check out the Patreon. I'm going to give it a slightly harder plug than normal just because Ollie's on. We've been talking about Codex. So um, <laughs> if you want to see what we've been talking about, I strongly recommend you go check out our Patreon pledge levels. You can get the free issue of Codex if you haven't seen it yet, uh, Codex Chrome on the website. So just, uh, you know, we always appreciate your support. So by all means. <laughs> Give it to us. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> that's all we've got. Super fun show. Have a good one. Steeple, fix it up. Um, <laughs> <laughs>